So, hallo, dann äh, darf ich Sie begrüßen zum zweiten Vortrag heute. Äh, eine ganz andere Ausrichtung, äh, als wir eben das hatten, geht um medizinische Daten und deren Verarbeitung und wie man dazu, wie man mit Open Source äh, Instrumenten da eventuell weiterkommen kann. Und äh, der Tim Adams wird uns dazu was erzählen, hat Informatik studiert in Bonn, also ganz aus der Nähe. Und ja, ja das ist vielen Dank. Um, ja, wie schon gesagt, äh, ich werde heute etwas erzählen über um, automatische Tumorerkennung und auch Segmentierung von CT-Scans. Einmal die Methoden, die Herausforderungen und um, wie weit man da kommt mit Open Source Software. Um, ich werde mal vorstellen, einen Ansatz, auch wobei, können wir direkt dahin gehen. Um, Erstmal allgemeine Einführung machen, grob erklären, worum es geht, uh, wie man so CT-Scans verarbeitet, um, wie Experten da rangehen, um, was es für Datensätze gibt, die wirklich online frei verfügbar sind. Da gibt es wirklich tatsächlich einen großen Umfang an Daten, die man nutzen kann. Dann weiter, um, wenn man da mit uh, digitalen Bildverarbeitungsmethoden rangehen. Was sind da die Herausforderungen? Um, wie wird das gemacht? Was für Möglichkeiten hat man? Um, dann zum vierten Teil werde ich ganz grob um, zeigen, wie man mit OpenCV, was die meisten vielleicht kennen, einer Bildverarbeitungssoftware um, bzw. Bibliothek, um, das Problem angehen kann, zumindest das Segmentierungsproblem. Werde ich mit kurzen Codebeispielen auch mal zeigen, wie so eine Segmentierung aussehen kann. Um, dann des Weiteren. Klassifizierung von äh, Tumoren einmal in gutartige, Entschuldigung. Um, I thought I could do it in German, but I, I can do it in English as well. The slides are in English, then I will just do it completely in English. This is fine. Uh, any more non-German non speakers? Okay, I will do it in English then. That's fine. Just stay. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I can do it in English. Um, should I repeat just briefly? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, our last part, results and perspectives. Um, we'll look at the results, um, especially I, um, in the available data, I will show uh, some data from a lung CT challenge from the year 2015. And um, we will um, look at our results that we obtained using um, OpenCV mainly and look how we measure up against uh, all the works that participated in this challenge. Here are some facts um, first. Um, this is all according to the World Health Organization from a fairly recent report from the 1st of February 2018. Um, in 2015, there were worldwide 8.8 .8 million deaths from cancer. Um, from these 8.8 .8 million, um, 1.69 million alone were from lung cancer because lung cancer is mo the most frequent cancer in men and also one of the most frequent cancers in women. Mm, and lung cancer is still one of the leading causes of death worldwide. So um, what's the problem, especially in lung cancer, is that if you have symptoms, um, they arrive fairly late. That means um, if you experience symptoms, it may already be too late. So what's important is uh, you need to have a really early diagnosis. So um, how are these diagnoses commonly done? Um, commonly used are uh, uh, computed tomography scans, short CT. Um, how does this work generally? Uh, I'm not an expert, but patients will lay down. Basically, um, will get driven to this tube and this CT machine will take cross-sections of your body using X-ray. Um, this may look like this. Um, this is taken from the SPIE AAPM Lung CT Challenge patient, I think six, yeah. Um, you see here, this is a cut um, fairly uh, like right below the chin probably. Um, we go deeper and this is a cut um, near the stomach. Um, as you see here, um, these are the first challenges is that these scans, depending on the depth where it's taken from, are um, quite variable. So you have um, big cavities of the lung. If it's right in the center of the lung, you may have no cavities. Um, you may have some organs which are 
in there also. And if you're wondering, um, in the second image, this is actually a lung tumor, a malignant lung tumor. So um, we have the scans on commonly they are analyzed from um, radiologists, meaning they will um, have all these depth information. They can look at the whole lung in the depth and they can weight nodules they find. They can weight them, for example, by size, um, by the location, by the shape, by the margin. Um, some will have a weather fuzzy margin, some will have a clear margin, and there's also factors which you can use to uh, differentiate between benign and malignant nodules. Yeah, um, as we see this, um, we could also um, take automatically from the images using image segmentation and um, general imaging te techniques. And we can use these as features to describe these nodules that we find inside of the lung and um, classify them as benign or malignant. Yeah, um, next thing, uh, what data is available? Um, there's actually a lot of um, data available for cancer at least, um, especially uh, this website um, called Cancer Imaging Archive has quite a lot of um, data sets available, not only from lung cancer, but of a variety of cancers, um, both CT and MRT scans. Um, they are publicly available, um, just to name a few, for lung cancer, there are actually a lot more. Um, maybe the most notable is the National Lung Screening Trial, um, short NLST, which consists of um, roughly 21 million images. Mm, also, there's the NLCLC Radionomics Genomics data set of 13,000 images. And um, what we, we will take a closer look on is the SPIE AAPM Lung CT Challenge data set which consists of um, roughly 22,000 images. So um, how does this data set look like? This was actually a challenge issued in 2015, which just recently ran out in 2017. I think December was the last um, evaluation of the results. Um, how do these scans look like? Generally, you have um, multiple images per patient, of course, um, roughly 300 per patient, um, depending on the slice step. Mm, they look like this. These um, are actually different depths of um, four different patients. Again, here we see um, the data set is quite variable. Um, there are tumors of different size. They have a different location. They have a different um, slice depth and also um, they have a different outline or contour. What's especially difficult is um, for segmentation, at least, if we have tumors um, that are inside the cavity of the lung, they are quite um, good to segment. What's harder is um, tumors that are interchrome to the lung wall. Um, we can't segment them that easy. Um, the format is DCOM, which is an open format for imaging data. Uh, dimensions 512 times 512 um, pixels. That's grayscale, of course. We have um, 10 patients which were meant for the calibration of the classifier, and we will have um, we had 60 patients that were meant for evaluation of the classifier of the participating works. Um, so the task actually was to weight these nodules. So we had per patients, we had the central coordinate of the nodule and the slice where it is found. And uh, then the radiologists were told to weight these nodules on a score for um, benign or malignant. So they generally, um, they give it a score and it should, sh should reflect the probability that this is a malignant tumor. And they had to do so for all 60 tumors of the test set using the calibration set for reference. They could use this for training. They could use this to um, generally calibrate their classifier. Um, yeah, how was this evaluated? Uh, it was evaluated using AUC, which is short for Area Under Curve, 
of some um, of receiver operating characteristics um, for ROC. Um, short discourse, how does this actually work? Um, if you look at this um, short example that I made up, uh, let's say you have uh, some nodules that you found and some of them are malignant here in red and some of them are benign and you weight them by a score in between minus one for really um, benign or plus one for really malignant. Then you could say um, I've weighted these and now I want to set a cutoff where I say let's say all bigger than zero I weight as malignant, all smaller than zero I weight as benign. And I could, for example, do so and set the cutoff in between here and say um, all above 0 0.2 are uh, malignant, all below uh, benign. Um, this would work fine for these three nodules that we classified correctly. So we would have three so-called true positives. We would have one false negative. This was this one because we uh, didn't um, suspect a malignant tumor here, even though it was but we will have um, sufficiently classified all our benign tumors as benign. We could do also do this cutoff, which will essentially turn it around. So we have um, all malignant tumors classified as malignant, but one benign tumor, which we also said is malignant. We could also just do this one. We could even do it here, and then we would for sure have all malignant tumors classified correctly, but just because we said all tumors are malignant. So basically you can set cutoffs anywhere. And um, as you see, a perfect separation is rarely possible. A perfect separation would be, for example, if I weighted all malignant tumors as a score of 1.0 and all benign tumors with a score of minus 1.0, then um, I could only do one threshold and this would be perfect because it would also always classify all benign as benign and all malignant as malignant. So what can we do then? Um, we can calculate two measurements, one of which is the so-called sensitivity which is the amount of true positives divided by the amount of true positives divided plus false negatives. So basically how sensitive our classifier is. And then the second measurement is uh, specificity, which is the um, amount of true negatives divided by uh, the amount of true negatives plus false positives, which is basically how specific our classifier is. And we want a both specific and sensible classifier. And we can plot this and create a curve using these different thresholds. These will, each of these thresholds will basically um, result in a different um, combination of sensitivity and specificity. We can plot this. And basically what you want is a high curve. So <coughs> if you, excuse me. So if you want, um, a good classifier, the best classifier basically would be um, a score of 1.0, um, an area under the curve of 1.0, which would mean the curve would go wide like this. This um, dotted line in the middle would be random guessing basically, and we want uh, possibly the biggest area under the curve that we can get. So um, this on the left is the curve that um, the radiologist scored, and the one on the right is the curve that the um, participants scored using um, digital imaging techniques and machine learning. And these are actually from humans specialists. So um, if you look at the plaque curve, this is the mean generally. And um, all curves, um, are uh, basically one radiologist who did this challenge. Same here. We had, I think, 10 participants. The dotted lines are the um, participants <coughs> that scored better than random guessing statistically. The, um, this line is the best participant with a score of 0 0.68. And um, <coughs> 
also this is the mean, and the participant scales um, scored between 0 0.050 and 0 0.68. The um, radiologists, of course, scored a lot better. Their AUC rating from 0 0.7 to 0 0.85. So basically, if you look at this, the best um, automated approach scored basically as good as the worst radiologist, which is still good, I think. Mm. Now, how can you um, realize such a system that can automatically um, classify such a tumor. First of all, a um, um, diagnosis problem is actually divided into multiple problems. Um, for one, you have a um, segmentation and location problem. So you don't want to search the tumor in the whole image. You want to search inside of the lung cavity. So you will have to um, basically you do a segmentation and you remove all unnecessary data. Um, second problem then is the actual problem that was issued by the challenge is to um, divide these tumors to benign tumors and malignant tumors. So first of all, um, segmentation. Why are we doing segmentation? Basically, we um, reduce the complexity of the problem. So we uh, have less area to search for for tumors and less um, errors that we can make. Um, Basically, CT scans are often have a lot of noise. We need to remove this. Um, we need to remove artifacts that we have in the background, as you see here. And we want to also remove the corpus of the patient because we don't want to search for tumors inside of the patients, but inside of the lung. Um, so what we do is we divide into semantically coherent segments. How can we do this? Um, just to name a few techniques, thresholding. <coughs> Thresholding, reaching, growing, morphological operations, and watershed transformation, just to name a few. Um, but we will look into these in detail um, using OpenCV later on, where I will shortly walk you to the segmentation, and we will see how this turns into this. Yeah, the harder part is the classification. I will also um, talk about this briefly. So what you will do is you will extract features from the image <coughs> and we will train a classifier based on these features that we learned and the classifier has to differentiate between benign and malignant nodules based on some thresholds that we calculate. Mm, how can we do this? Uh, which is very, very popular right now is convolutional neural networks. They actually did not perform so well on this challenge. I think they uh, did turn in fourth. Um, actually, the manual old school um, feature extraction and classification um, performed a lot better than the neural networks on this challenge, which may be um, because the data set used for training was not big enough for neural networks to perform well, or maybe um, it's still too hard, or um, it was only one group that used neural networks and the parameters were too well good. Um, but this just guessing, we will um, look at the second option, which means we will first um, extract features. What can we use? Um, for example, statistical features. We can look at this um, and look at the min, max, average, or mean query value and use this as a feature. We may also look at contours, uh, for example, area, convexity, parameter, or eccentricity. Or um, What's performing really well in recent works is heraldic features, which are basically um, texture feature, where we look at the texture of the tumor, which is different for benign and malignant nodules. But we will um, look at this later after the segmentation. So for the um, classification, there's a variety of options. Um, we could use support vector machines, weaker, discrimination functions, random forests. There are a lot of approaches and are basically all used in literature. But also here, what's um, really successful are support vector machines. But basically, you could and you can use any classificator for um, future classification. 
So um, to the interesting part, um, we will do some hands-on segmentation. Um, I will show you how you can segment such a CT scan using OpenCV. So you remember this one. Um, when we look at this now, um, we first the first problem at hand is these borders over here. As we've seen, like these CT scans are quite diverse, so we want a robust algorithm that can segment basically all CT scans, and some of them are adjacent to the outer image border, and some of them are not. So what we want to do is um, remove this outer border in the first step. Mm, how can we do this? I um, have a bit of a cold, so <laughs> please bear with me. <laughs> we will um, calculate the border around the image, which we will lay above the image, and we will remove this, these borders. So we have a continuous background, and we have one single background <coughs> in the image. Um, next problem that we see is we have quite a lot of artifacts. Um, as we see here, this is closing properly of the patient. Um, we have the tube. This is why here are a lot of artifacts. Um, the math that the patient lays down, all these needs to be need to go in the first step. Um, <coughs> we need a few steps to remove them. What we do first is we make a threshold. Threshold means um, basically in our query value, Images we have for each pixel on um, value in between 0 and 255, which is the um, intensity of the pixel. So, bright pixels have a high intensity, um, dark pixels have a low intensity. And we say all, as we see here, <coughs> all pixels with a high intensity should be the background, and all pixels with low intensity should be the foreground. That's what we do here. We set a threshold, and we get this kind of image. So now the background is white, and the foreground is black. So the foreground is basically 0, and the background 1, because it's a binary image. We then can um, use this image as a basis for a connected components algorithm. So it basically takes as an argument a binary image, and it will write the results to a new mattress where it saves labels for components. <coughs> we can look at this. Um, this is an isolated component as well as this, as well as the background is also an isolated component. So now if we look at the components, the background is always going to be the biggest component here in blue. So if we go ahead now and remove <coughs> the biggest component, set it black or zero, um, we will have removed the background as well as the, <coughs> the artifacts that we have above here. What we still have um, are some bigger artifacts down here, which are, see here, um, they are so bright that by thresholding they also get um, the same value as the corpus. So how can we remove these? We will do um, erosion meaning um, we will slowly remove pixels from the borders and we will actually do so um, in an with a small kernel size first. We um, define a kernel and we set our number of components to infinity. <coughs> so um, and now we're um, trying to reduce our number of components till we have one left, and this one component will be our patient. So we um, erode, and we again calculate the number of components, and we increase over here the kernel size. Um, if the kernel size wasn't big enough, we will still have some artifacts left. So we will again erode, we will calculate the number of components. If they are bigger than one, do it again, and we increase that much till our background artifacts are gone, and we have one component, which is namely the web cage. 
So um, this is the first step of the segmentation. Second one, uh, we have removed the background. And this is really robust. This works for all patients in the set. So next thing, we want to remove the lung corpus around here. And what's the challenge here, as we see here, this is intercron. So it's not trivial to segment this. <coughs> so we want to remove the lung corpus as a whole. <coughs> okay, first thing first, we again calculate the image, the binary image. This time we have a different threshold type. We, um, last time we did an inverse binary image where we set um, images that have a high intensity are zero and image pixels that have a low intensity are one. And now we turn it around. We say pixels that have a high intensity are assigned to the label one and those who have a low intensity are zero, as you see here. And now we still have the problem, this is adjacent to, this nodule is adjacent to the long wall. We don't want this. So what can we do? We can use the erode function. We will erode by a kernel and just erode as much as possible that this connection is broken. So now we can um, look at the image. Um, we have different components now. We have this component, which is the rib cage, and we have this component, which is the nodule. So we can now take these components and put them again on the binary image, like this and using a uh, watershed algorithm, which is basically a flood fill algorithm. So we um, expand the labels until they touch, until they meet each other, and then we um, construct a so-called watershed. <coughs> Excuse me. Over here, which will divide these two labels. So now um, we have, again, the biggest label. This one at time is green. This is the corpus. We can remove the corpus. And we're done. We see here we have successfully segmented it. We have um, only the inner lungs left. And we did not um, segment out this nodule that we need for classification. So how does classification work? Or how can we do classification? Um, I told you we will use um, heraldic features, which I will explain now. So basically, um, as I told you, you can look at an image, um, basically at a gray value image is an image um, consisting of intensities. Mm, actually, this is wrong, like um, a high intensity should be black, should be white. <coughs> And the lower one should be black, but um, you get the idea. We have intensities, and now we can look at the neighborhood of all of our pixels. If you look here, um, this one to its right, we can look at this in different direction. Zero degrees is basically vertical. 90 degrees would be, other one. zero degrees is horizontal. 90 degrees would be vertical. We can look in all directions and look at the neighborhood. So we see we have um, one, two times one right next to a zero in the zero degree direction. So we put a two in our co occurrence matrix. We do this for all the intensities. So one to two is one, and two to two is one to three times, three to three is once, and so on, and we can do this for all directions. Um, we have them a matrix which we will normalize, which will give basically the probabilities of the pixels curing to each other. Then we can um, take some measurements. For example, we can look at the energy of the matrix or the variance, or especially interesting the entropy, because I think <coughs> if you look at these, um, basically, malignant nodules have a much higher entropy texture-wise. So if we look at this feature in our matrices, we can um, use this to differentiate between the both of them. 
I need to go back. Here we are. Um, these features are basically, I think, 13 months all in all, and we, um, we're not actually using all of them, but we use a subset of these features because not all of them are good for application for um, tumor differentiation. So what can we do now? Um, we look at our image and we will use actually a sliding window approach. We will traverse the image and look at different parts of the image in different scales. And we will use, we will get the features from these sub-images and we will weight them by an SVM. If you can put all these scales on top of each other, we will get a heat map. In this heat map, what it does, it basically describes um, positions in the image which have a texture which is very similar to tumors. So as we look here, we will find this tumor. We can then use it again in um, our component image to get the bounding box of the tumor. So we identify this component. We can we identify that this component is, in fact, a nodule, which we will have a look at. And we will then um, find out the bounding box, get the nodule is awaited, and then we um, will put it in a nozzle SVM, which we trained on nodule data, and we will get a malignity score like the radiologist did as well. So, um, it's my time, looking good. Um, how do we measure up? Um, if you remember, this was um, the AOC curve of the radiologists, which scored uh, in between 0 0.7 and 0 0.85. The participants scored from 0 0.5, which is basically random guessing, uh, to 0 0.68. And using our simple approach, we score actually 0 0.61, which isn't too bad, which scored, I think, if we participated, it would actually measure up as third, I think. So um, not too bad. So what did we learn? Um, actually, our fair data collections of lung CT data are available, as we've seen. We can use this for um, training could also use this for training of neural networks because we have quite a big amount of data. We have data sets which have um, about 20 million images, which should be sufficient. Um, another thing that we learned is that even though we score relatively well, we cannot replace radiologists. They still perform quite a lot better, but um, what we can at least do is support radiologists with, oops, Okay, we can um, support radiologists in their um, diagnosis by giving them systems which can help them find the tumors, which can um, propose candidates for radiologists um, that they can take a closer look at and rate them. And um, as you have seen, open source works well in this um, approach. Um, OpenC is a brilliant library which can successfully use for segmentation as well as classification. OpenCV also provides an implementation of a superad vector machine. So basically, you could do all these steps, which I've done um, in OpenCV, and it would be completely solved using open source software. Um, I want to shortly thank my um, professor, uh, Dr. Volker Steinhager of University of Bonn. I basically did this before. Um, as my bachelor thesis, uh, and he provided good advice for me um, as my advisor. Um, if you want to take a look at the image data, um, Wiki Cancer Imaging Archive, there are a lot of um, image data on cancer, not only lung cancer, but also all kinds of cancer, and really quite a huge database. Yeah, OpenCV is a nice library, and um, if you want to source of any images, <laughs> you can also look at them here, um, which takes me to the end. Um, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Um, yes, please. So um, if I understood you correctly, um, 
the main thing you do, the main work you do is finding candidates for classification. Yes, so basically. Uh, and um, finding the candidates, uh, there was a number of steps involved with uh, image preprocessing. Mm -hmm. And uh, each of these steps depends on one or even a number of parameters. Yes. So you have to select the correct parameters or you will find nothing or many false positives or many too many candidates for anyone to be helpful. Yes. And uh, how do you select the parameters? Is there any thing, is there any algorithm or do you have to select them manually? Because that means you will have different parameters in basically every image. So, um, um, yes, if we go back. Oh, right at the beginning. So what you um, get from the challenge, at least, um, was 10 picks, 10 patients for calibration. So we had these patients, and you knew um, where the tumors were and if they were benign or malignant. So we, I, what I did is I used these 10 patients and looked for parameters which do the segmentations as good as possible. What you actually can do is you um, can't segment all images perfectly. There actually there are tumors which are intercrone in such a way with long wall that you can't divide them using erosion. If the um, section connecting to the long wall is bigger than the tumor in the cavity, you can't erode it till um, it's separated because basically you will just erode the whole tumor. So this approach is also um, a limitation. It's not perfect, of course. Um, I choose the parameters in a way that um, it solved most problems for the 10 um, calibration patients. But um, I think I succeeded in about 87% of all um, training, training patients segmentation-wise because there are cases which you can't, um, which you can't um, segment using this technique. So what's the problem is this like very wide field, very um, different um, kinds of patients, different kinds of images, which is why you have to um, choose the most robust algorithm that you can, but you probably won't be able to solve any problems. Uh, yeah, in the beginning you said that convolutional neural networks are seemingly not the best option. Do you have maybe an idea why is that? Pardon? Do you have an idea why the convolutional neural networks are not a better option? Um, for this data set, yeah. um, I just I could assume it's because we don't have much data. Because um, neural networks normally take a lot of data to learn um, to be good classifiers. And we look at 10 patients for calibration, which is not much. She also said if we um, use this for training, 21 million images, I, um, it might be that neural networks would have scored a lot better. Thank you for that. Yes? Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you limited yourself in this data set of seven patients, right? Exactly, uh, also, yeah. uh, at the beginning, you mentioned there are sources with over 22 million uh, images available. Mm -hmm. uh, was there a reason why you limited yourself to this challenge or this project was this limited? Um, yes, because I wanted to be able um, to compare myself to the challenge. If I used a different data set for um, training, it would not be comparable as good. I just wanted to use these calibration data for training, which which I did basically. I think if I used also what's what's difficult is um, CT data is not exactly the same. Sometimes it's a different quality if you use different data sets. So you can't probably we can't use all data sets for training for um, all different data sets because they vary in quality um, in the way they are um, taken. If you look at, if you just go to the site and look at different sets, we'll see that um, they also are quite different, even though it's um, they have like a 
normalized formats, they are quite different in quality. So I'm not sure if you can use any data set for training for any test data set. Which wasn't the main reason. The main reason was basically just what I wanted to add. The main reason was I wanted to keep to this challenge so I can compare my results the best. the pipeline you produce, the contribution oh. of this project. Pardon? Could you? Uh, so the contribution is the pipeline you produced. Yes, basically. The question was, I mean, I think I forgot, I mean, what was the best result achieved in the challenge? The best result in the challenge? Yeah. Um, it was an AOC score of 0 0.68. Um, what they used were a support vector regressor for classification. Um, they scored the best, actually. But what they did uh, is basically, <coughs> which is um, why I don't recommend this challenge, probably, is they used an in-house training data set. So they did not use these 10 calibration patients. They had a bigger data set. Any further questions? No? And I have to thank you. So uh, this library you used, OpenCV? Yes. Um, it only works for image data or? It's basically a um, um, library for uh, image processing, but it also has a lot of classifier. You can use this to classify any data using um, support vector machines, for example. Yeah, okay. That was my question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, any questions? No. Then I have to thank you again. Thank you. And. Uh,